Uh, let's call to order the regular business meeting of the Board of Education for Monday, <coughs> Casey Rooney absent for the record. Um, our agenda tonight, we will invite anybody from the public who would like to speak. I'd ask that you limit your comments to three minutes, please. Uh, brief president's report, including the student school board representatives. Um, superintendent's report, uh, approve the consent vote agenda, which was reviewed earlier this month in committee. Uh, brief update from facilities and finance. Uh, brief update from program and personnel. Uh, no property, correct? No property. Okay, that's correct. Steel? Nope. Stealing books? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's Nothing like a grand entrance, right? Or grab breaks into the library. Get the bag. Let's see. No ISB. And we will have an executive session tonight for two matters. Um, first one, collective negotiating matters, 5 ILCS 120-2C2. And two, employment of employee, 5 ILCS 120-2C1. We will not be taking any board action after that session. Okay? So let's start. Uh, anybody from the public who would like to speak? No. Okay. No, no. okay. All right. Uh, next president's report. I have one item. Uh, many of you know that uh, at yesterday's 2018 Illinois chapter of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, uh, there was a banquet. And uh, our, our distinguished D-128 uh, superintendent, Dr. Prentice Lee, was formally inducted into the chapter's Hall of Fame and awarded the cha chapter's Outstanding American Award. Okay. So if you think that's a big deal just because of wrestling, um, let me just highlight a few things. Uh, each year, a single person from Illinois may be selected for this prestigious award, which is given to a former wrestler or wrestling coach who has benefited from the disciplines learned and taught through the sport of wrestling to achieve the highest levels of success in his or her profession. Only 12 former Illinois wrestlers have had this award since 1994, when the Illinois chapter was started. Other award winners have been CEOs, military leaders, medical professionals, and college presidents. The National Wrestling Hall of Fame's Illinois chapter had yet to honor a public school educator, and Dr. Lee became its first inductee from the, from the profession. 2015 Lifetime Service Award inductee and current Libertyville head uh, wrestling coach Dale Egger presented the plaque to Dr. Lee. Uh, and I also understand there was a really nice jacket. Yes, there's a, it's our version of the master's green jacket. There we go. <laughs> it's the wrestling version. It it's a thick kind of winter coat. You know, it's nice. It's very nice. It's green? It's great. Yes, it is green. <laughs> very nice. For pictures to follow. Bring out the green jacket. Okay, so congratulations again. He had no idea I was going to do that because if he did, no, I I, didn't. he would have told me I, sh I, I shouldn't do that. Um, so let the record state that you don't know everything. Yeah. As you all already knew, right? You guys already knew that. I, I would just, you know, very quickly, I just want to say that I'm very honored and very humbled. Wrestling has been uh, a huge part of my, my life since high school, and it has uh, really informed um, who I am and what I do and how I go about it. So it's, uh, it's, it's been a very important part of my life, and I think it's reflected by many things that we do here in the district that I've done in my previous um, life before I came. And I want to thank um, Dale Eggert, longtime LHS wrestling coach and teacher extraordinaire, just an amazing individual uh, who's an Illinois uh, Wrestling Hall of Fame member as uh, a competitor and a coach. And uh, Mick Torres, our director of technology. Mick was a longtime wrestling coach and an athletic director. And he is also in the Illinois Wrestling Hall of Fame. So Mick and uh, Dale, unbeknownst to me, uh, nominated me for the award, and lo and behold, the committee actually 
chose me for the award, but it was a very nice uh, ceremony and um, you know very touching. So thank you, Pat, for yeah, well, recognizing I think, it's, I think it's fantastic that um, amongst all those very distinguished people that have been recognized in the past, that this year was a public school educator. So congratulations. Thank you. All right, now student school board representatives. I'll let you guys decide who goes first. Do you guys like to start? Yeah. Sure. So this month, the Student Diversity Council gave a great presentation to Freshman Transition. They prepared a Four Corners activity in order to show that the different kinds of people have many similar interests. They presented the classes Vernon Hills Statistics of Race and Language to show how diverse Vernon Hills really is. Uh, two weeks ago, Vernon Hills had their annual Write Assembly for the freshman class. Speaker Mike Donahue from Value Up reminded students about the important lesson of walking a mile in other shoes and to never forget to fight for their value. Three seniors shared their stories and struggles that they overcame throughout their high school careers. Freshmen were given the opportunity to speak to their class about some of the challenges that they have faced in both open mic time and in smaller discussion groups. During this time, the sophomores and seniors of Vernon Hills served at Feed My Starving Children to help give back. 119 out of the 120 spots were filled very quickly by sophomores and senior, seniors excited to be able to package food for those in dire need. The homecoming dance was a great success. We had just under two, not 200, 900 students attend this year, beating last year's uh, record attendance of 850 students. Congratulations to Boys Golf on their eighth consecutive win at the IHSA Regional Golf Championships. And special recognition goes out to jun junior Rohan Vasudeva, who shot a 79 at the IHSA sectionals and qualified for state. Congratu congratulations to Rohan and Boys Golf. Congratulations to our 19 seniors that have been named National Merit Commended Scholars. This month, Girls Swim and Dive has been helping to raise awareness and funds for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. The JDRF is the leading global organization funding type 1 diabetes research and is committed to keeping people healthy and safe until a cure can be found. Girls Swim and Dive hosted a blue out meet to raise money for JDRF. Parents designed shirts, made baked goods, and promoted the meet around Vernon Hills. The girls' parents were instrumental in the money raised this year. Vernon Hills Swim and Dive is proud to have raised $1,000 this year to donate to JDRF in the search for the cure. Uh, Vernon Hills Band had their annual band festival where 7th and 8th grade band students came to Vernon Hills to play with the high school band. Both of the bands have been rehearsing their repertoire during classes and were able to finally re rehearse together this month. Guest conductor Erica Needlinger perfected the pieces and led a great performance that same night. This Friday and Saturday and the following Friday and Saturday at 7 p.m., Vernon Hills Backlight Theater will be presenting Jerry Herman's musical Hello Dolly. The entire cast and crew is made up of over 90 students who are ecstatic to perform this weekend. We hope, hope that the members of the board will be able to make it out for a great performance. The following VHHS musicians were selected to the ILMEA District 7 festivals where they will perform in November. Congratulations to David Rosales, Robert Black, Cecilia Gao, Kaylee Brand, Mackenzie Furlitt, Sari Gluck, Nicole Barris, Aditi Ram, Donnelly Black, Jillian Bowes, Jackson Kisnick, Kristen Kai, Timmy Zhang, Joshua Liu, Patrick Chian, Jeffrey Zhang, <coughs> Sam Rumzis, Jane Cronin, Sasha Shore, Ian Joe, Sophia Heiser, and Hannah Merrick. We wish them good luck at the district festivals and in competing for spots at the state festivals. We have a lot for sports. Um, on October 3rd, girl golfers Jackie Park and Grace M both competed at their IHSA Regional Championship Tournament and qualified individually to move on to the IHSA Sectional Championship Tournament. Congratulations to both the girls and the rest of the golf team on a great season. Uh, congratulations to the girls cross country team who recently won their CSL North Conference Championship. This was the second year in a row that all seven varsity runners earned all conference honors and it marks the third consecutive CSL North title for the varsity team. The Vernon Hills JV and Frosh Soft teams also won the team titles in their races. Special recognition goes out to freshman Emma Wakefield, who set a new freshman record for Vernon Hills cross country, running a time of 18.08 in the varsity race. And this past weekend, the girls won their IHSA Regional Championship, which was the fourth win in four years for the team, who will now compete at the IHSA Sectional Championship this Saturday at Woodstock. Also, congratulations to the boys' cross-country team who placed fifth at their IHSA Regional Championship this past weekend. They will also move on to compete at the sectional championship this weekend at Woodstock. 
Good luck to both teams. Uh, congratulations also to the boys' soccer team who won their IHSA regional final game this past Friday. Carlos Aguilar and Stephen Aw scored the goals that led the Cougars to an exciting 2-1 victory over Lakes, and they will now compete against Harvard at the IHSA semi, uh, sectional semifinal this, at Harvard this Wednesday. Brothers Jack and Devin Mulcrone, who are a senior and freshman here at VHHS, have pitched an idea for an energy farm on campus. Having participated in various sports here, they noticed how windy the athletic fields can be, and it gave them an idea. And they now envision placing 15 to 20 vertical wind turbines around the VHAC to help power the site and save money on campus. And in addition, they would create an energy classroom in the school that would be designated for energy education, including data on the turbines and how they're helping the school. Earlier this summer, the brothers pitched the idea to the village board, receiving abundant positive feedback. And we are proud to have such forward-looking students at our school and look forward to following the actions of the Mulcrums as they continue to pursue this vision. In a survey of the senior class, we found that a majority of students are applying either early action or early decision at one or more schools and have been working hard on their applications. Over 85% of the respondents have taken advantage of CRC resources while doing so. The most used resources, including CRC college visits, talking to Mrs. Bolito, our college counselor, and CRC drop-in hours in the mornings before school. A majority of students are pretty stressed about college applications, rating their stress levels of four or five out of five, but we are pleased to see so many students taking advantage of the resources available to them to help calm their stress and perfect their applications. Earlier this month, 16 new seniors were inducted into NHS at the fall induction ceremony. NHS is excited to welcome these new members and we wish them congratulations on this accomplishment. This past Friday, the first group of Cougar Class Act Awards for the year were distributed. There were 10 VHHS students recognized for their exemplification of compassion and encouragement and for representing the daring mission at our school. We are happy to see these students and others setting such great examples for the student body and wish them congratulations. And this year's Daughters of the American Revolution Good Citizen Award has been named to Jimmy, Senior Jimmy McDonald. He was chosen for his demonstration of the qualities of dependability, service, leadership, and patriotism. Congratulations to Jimmy. So for athletics, football had their last game, and they finished off their season on Friday after a loss to Zion Benton. After a long season of hard work and growth, the team is looking forward to coming back stronger next year. For the cross-country meet at Adler this Saturday, both the men's and women's cross-country teams had a strong showing, with both of them advancing to six sectionals. The boys placed first overall and the girls placed third. On the boys' cross-country team, junior Will Gordon was ecstatic about the team's performance, and we're very proud of his second place ranking overall. And for the boys' soccer versus Stevenson game on Saturday, the boys' soccer team won the regional final with a 7-0 victory over Stevenson. Um, they, they will move on to play friend on Wednesday in the sectional semifinals. The boys were also recognized at the last home football game after completing the first perfect season in LHS soccer history. And so on clubs and activities, so the debate team kicked off their season with an incredibly strong start at the Schomburg Saxon Invitational this Saturday. In the Lincoln Douglas style of debate, Drew Hopkins won fourth place overall, with, Pauline, with Paulina Fandrova winning first overall and second place speaker. Public Forum also produced fantastic results. Jessica Lee won second place speaker, and Kat won first place speaker. Together, they placed second overall at the tournament. It was also the first tournament for the Rebuild's newest debaters, and in total, we had 14 new debaters get their feet wet this Saturday, and the team is excited for the year ahead. Their next tournament will be November 3rd. And for finally, for math team, we had, they had a North Suburban Math League invite where the Rebuild won third overall with several students writing perfect papers and the math team is excited to be studying the next topic. Okay, uh, moving on to the academics. Um, the AP Spanish classes had an amazing culture experience last Thursday. They began their day trying Spanish tapas before heading to the Art Institute to explore and learn about Spanish artists, such as El Greco and Pablo Picasso. They had a great time recording videos, opinions, and analysis of the art to share with the rest of the class. Um, in AP Psychology, this year, um, it is now a year-long course, and this allows for more time for students to gain hands-on experience in labs to bring the concepts that they learn to life. Um, Ms. Bosman, the students got the opportunity to dissect sheep brains as a part of learning the relationship between structure and function in psychology. Junior Drew Hopkins participated in the dissection and said, 
it was pretty cool to be holding the entire existence of a living being in your hand. Everything they ever were or had the potential to be is a squishy blob in the palm of your hand. Having this experience while still in high school is truly an incredible opportunity, and the students in psychology are grateful to the D128 Foundation for Learning for funding this lab. The human anatomy and physiology classes completed their annual skull pumpkin carving project last week. Students could be seen toting around pumpkins in the halls in preparation for the big day. Uh, students carved a classic jack-o'-lantern and labeled the surface with the various parts of the skull and, completed pr and the completed products were on display in the courtyard for everyone to see. Moving on to the arts, um, the fall musical Pippin will be showing this weekend on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. The whole school is abuzz with excitement about the acrobatics and circus-themed choreography that will be featured in the show. The pit cast and crew of the musical have grown as a family throughout the past couple of weeks, and we cannot wait to see how all this hard work pays off. The Illinois Music Educators Association, or ILMEA, has officially selected its students to perform at the State Festival in January. From LHS, we have a number of musicians who will perform in the choir, band, orchestra, and jazz band. These students are thrilled that they have been selected after this intense audition process, and their teachers are undoubtedly proud of these achievements. The three orchestras put on a fun and spooky performance on October 16th for their annual Friday night concert. The performers enjoyed the various types of pieces that they played and were all smiles about the show the next day. So finally, we have school ongoings. Um, the school kicked off Red Ribbon Week with a fun night of decorating games yesterday. The students painted windows and decorated pumpkins to raise awareness of drug and alcohol prevention. The event was student-led with the help of prevention and wellness staff. A movie night was put on by Life of a Wildcat on October 5th. There was a large turnout and students had a ton of fun. It provided a fun, safe way to spend a Friday night and cans were collected for the food drive as well. The movie shown was Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The annual Snowflake Leader Training happened this passing Friday at Hawthorne Middle South. The program lets D128 students co-lead groups of middle schoolers in an inspirational afternoon of activities and speeches. Junior Karina Kamshin participated this year and, said, and stated that it was a fun experience and one of the speakers in particular was especially inspiring. She also described her group of seventh graders as funny and that allowed for an enjoyable time. It was great to see positive student leaders like Karina leaving impact on future D128 students. LHS ruled out a new honor this month, the True Wildcat Award. This award is presented upon students who embody the characteristics of being daring. Already, we've had 16 students who were recognized. Finally, there was another session of the Green Dot Bystander Training Program. They spent a day learning how to deal with bullying and harassment situations. The event was led by Dr. Nelson, and the goal is to roll the training out to select students this year before making it school-wide in the future. All right, great job, guys. Thank you. All right, next superintendent's report, Dr. Lee. Okay, hey, thank you, Pat, and great job as always, keeping uh, everyone up to date and sharing the great news and everything that's going on. And congratulations, Kat. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Okay, uh, Libertyville High School has been named the recipient of the 2018 U.S. Department of Education National Blue Ribbon of Excellence Award. U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos announced the nation's Blue Ribbon Schools for 2018 on October 1st. The 349 schools recognized will be honored at an awards ceremony on November 7th through 8th in Washington, D.C. The Blue Ribbon Award of Excellence is an extremely competitive and rigorous award competition and is the highest distinction granted to schools by the U.S. Department of Education. The coveted National Blue Ribbon Schools Award affirms the hard work of educators, families, and communities in creating safe and welcoming schools where students master challenging and engaging content. Now in its 36th year, the National Blue Ribbon Schools Program has bestowed recognition on more than 8,800 schools. Recipient schools are honored in one of two performance categories based on all student scores, subgroup student scores, and graduation rates. LHS was recognized in the exemplary high performing school category. Schools recognized in this category are among their state's highest performing schools as measured by state assessments or nationally normed tests. LHS was also a 1990 recipient of the U.S. Department of Education National Blue Ribbon of Excellence Award. So why don't we take a minute and give Tom and the LHS team and family and community a big round of applause. This is Dr. Peter. 
and um, I just want to note for the record that Vernon Hills uh, in 2010 was a U.S. Department of um, uh, Education Blue Ribbon Award winner. And uh, for those of us that have been in the business for a while, it's much different than uh, the process is much different for being selected than it was even 15 or 20 years ago. Because now, eventually, if you meet all of the other standards in your application uh, and you appear to be an exemplary school, um, you are not considered uh, further um, in the process unless um, all of your students, including your student subgroups, are meeting very rigorous achievement metrics. So it really, at its end, it is a performance-driven award to ensure that all your students are, again, achieving. So uh, Vernon Hills went through that same criteria in 2010, um, and there are a lot of really great schools out there that never get the Blue Ribbon uh, recognition because one or more of their subgroups are not performing at the metrics. So, you know, um, our two schools are just amazing. Tom, congratulations to all of you. Also, a little shout out to Marina Scott, you know, who's the principal for nine years at uh, Libertyville High School, really did a great job there. And Dr. Colentis has come in and done what we do in this district, and that is we always build on excellence. So great job, Tom, and congratulations to um, you and your team. And uh, Tom and Ray Alvin and uh, a couple of us from district office will be going, uh, traveling out to Washington, D.C. to receive the award. Uh, they're nice enough to let us tag along for the ride, uh, a couple of us from district office. But I will tell you that one of my best memories in my 39-year career was going out with Dr. Swick and Dr. Gilliam and uh, Cheryl Stephens, the school improvement coordinator at Vernon Hills when they won the award in 2010. It's pretty special stuff, and they really do a nice job with the ceremony. So that's going to be really exciting. So great job. Congratulations. Okay, uh, D128 hosted a special Olympics bocce ball tournament on October 14th at VHHS. D12 athletes who competed did an amazing job. Congratulations to all of our medal and ribbon winners and those who won gold and qualified for the state summer games in Bloomington next June uh, 7th through 9th. Alex Donato, Mackenzie Runke, uh, Nathan Ferrara, and uh, Benny Roberts in singles, and the double teams of Alex Donato and uh, Anna Scholler. Uh, Joel Smith and Benny Roberts and Haley Dunbar and Mackenzie Runke. And uh, if you think you're a pretty good vo uh, bocce ball player, uh, anytime you want to play those kids, they will play you. And I can tell you from past experience, um, they will embarrass you. They're really good, okay? Um, I think the VHS uh, student board reps uh, mentioned the uh, VHS students who were ILMEA District 7 festivals. Uh, if I'm not uh, correct, um, we didn't get there with the LHS report, right? So I'll read the names. From LHS, Will Anderson, Albert Sterner, Alan Liu, Ben Mayo, uh, Sarah D'Onofrio, Den Natalie Smith, Annika Larson, Kirsten Tolander, uh, Annalisa Waddick, Rachel Hamilton, Noah Kublank, Jason Govern, Eloise Heights, Sebastian Angino, uh, Melissa Yi. Uh, David Lee, Katie Olson, Richie Rush, Ian Smith, Matt Newberger, Samantha Fan, Anna Hirons, Celia McDermott Hinman, uh, Amanda Murbach, um, Karen Tarman, Richard Zhao, uh, Elias Anderson, Carter Smith, Ava Samatri, uh, Emily Wadick, Elias Anderson, Jason Govern, Rachel Hamilton, Alex G. Annalisa Waddick, Matt Harvey, and Thomas Power. So uh, congratulations, and for high school musicians, being selected to the ILMEA State Festival is the highest individual honor they can receive. So congratulations to the Vernon Hill students that were read earlier and the Liberty Bell students. Uh, Pat, before I continue with a uh, great night of celebration for District 128, I am holding a proclamation that has been signed by Governor Bruce Romer and Secretary of State Jesse White. Um, if uh, the students aren't aware yet, it is National Principals Week uh, this week, and so we have a proclamation from, again, the Governor and the Secretary of State. Um, whereas school principals play an important part in the role of education and growth of children in elementary, middle, and secondary schools across the state of Illinois, and school principals are responsible for promoting education and working with parents and teachers to ensure that each child receives services 
that meet their needs to excel in the classroom. And it is the primary responsibility of the state of Illinois to preserve and improve resources for schools so that all students have the opportunity to receive a quality education and foundation for a successful future. And the Illinois Principals Association, which represents more than 5,000 educational leaders statewide, believes that learning is a lifelong process and that education of our children is the highest priority. And for that reason, the Illinois Principals Association is dedicated to developing, supporting, and advocating for school leaders and Educational leaders face many challenges in edu educating our young people, and it is through their perseverance and passion that Illinois is able to continue to produce quality, career-ready students. And we must continue to encourage, support, and recognize those who have a positive impact on Illinois students in the educational system in the land of Lincoln. Therefore, I, Bruce Rauner, Governor of the State of Illinois, do hereby proclaim the week of October 21st through the 27th as Illinois Principals Week, and Friday, October 26th, 2018, as Illinois Principals Day, to recognize principals and the Illinois Principals Association for all they do to help our children learn and succeed. And with that, let's give Tom and John a round of applause. Friday off? It does. Wow. It does. I guess I'll need to check and make sure you're here now, right? So, okay. Um, next on uh, the superintendent's report agenda tonight is uh, ACT student achievement data and Illinois school report card. So we're going to turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Rita Fisher. Rita? Thank you. Um, the purpose of the presentation tonight, thank you, Brian. Uh, the purpose of our presentation tonight is to share the assessment data that we generally share this time of year, which is all good news, but also to update you on some changes in the Illinois School Report Card that are necessitated really by Illinois ISBE's, uh, Illinois State Board of Education's um, requirement to comply with the regulations under ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act. And so the Illinois plan for complying with ESSA requires some changes into um, how we report school progress and hold schools, schools accountable that we'll see on the upcoming report card published at the end of October. Um, and, and really the focus tonight is to say that while it's important to share with you our assessment data and to comply with the regulations, our focus is really shifting to how do we measure what matters and how do we measure student development of the daring attributes described in our mission. Um, that will come next month, um, so just a little preview of uh, data that will be shared next month as well. So first, our um, AP and ACT data. Um, in regards to advanced placement exams, we've shared longitudinal, longitudinal data over time, and it continues to be true that more and more D128 students are participating in AP exams, and a greater number of students over time are having success in those exams. So while increasing participation dramatically, we're at the same time maintaining and often increasing the percentage of those students who are successful on exams. So very proud of our data indicating efforts in uh, the district in both schools to provide AP courses that are accessible to a wider number of students. We have new this year AP Environmental Science, and you're going to be hearing uh, about that class in greater detail with the presentation on the Libertyville AP Environmental Science investigation of the fish kill in Butler Lake in coming months, too. So our goal with our AP program is not to encourage every student to take every AP class we offer. In fact, we'd love for students to choose balance and remain resilient and healthy with our daring mission, but uh, to continue to provide access to AP courses to a greater number of students so that at least one student, at least every student experiences the rigor of a college course while in high school. Next, we have our ACT data. Um, uh, this year marks a change in how we're reporting ACT composite scores as well. As you'll recall, the class of 2017 was the last graduating class 
to have had um, an in-school ACT administered when they were juniors so that every member of the class of 2017 participated in the, AP, in the ACT administration. That had been true for uh, many years previously, and that was formally included in a uh, state accountability measure. Um, we've always reported the graduating class data, which is the most recent ACT score earned by members of that graduating class. And so we're, we're comparing apples to oranges when we look at 2017 to 2018. We saw an increase in the composite score in both schools and district-wide, but we had about a 76% participation rate among the 128 students in the ACT class of 2018. So it's not the same 100% participation that we've had previously, but the composite score continues to increase. numbers but not percents on the uh, the way that it's reported by state so the number <coughs> yeah fewer students statewide and probably um, fewer students uh, uh, overall more statewide than you know we still had a greater percentage of our students participating in district 128 than statewide because it's no longer required so the state saw a jump and we did as well and the SAT is now the required is yeah. now the required test for juniors so right. all juniors in the state take the SAT now, right. instead of the ACE, based on the change in contract awarding several years ago. We just wonder yeah. if there's a <clears throat> higher correlation in 18 of the people who are taking it are selecting to take it, they want to take it, sure. and that's, that's a general yeah. assumption. Yeah. The assumption would be that those take it are preparing for it more and you may right. have higher scores. Right. Would be a hypothesis that probably plays into that. And you can see that at the state. And they have the means to take it multiple times. Yeah. So the, the um, graduating class data is not necessarily the highest score that each student earns on the ACT. It's reported as the most recent ACT administration, which often we hope is the highest score, right? But not the case every time. Oh, so the numbers when everybody had to take it were. It, it, right. It never when the graduating class data, as reported by ACT, is the most recent ACT okay. test taken by uh, the members of that graduating class. Is how they calculate that. For everything. Yeah. yeah. That hasn't changed, but the participation rate has changed. So, um, because of the Illinois ESSA plan and uh, our requirements to report school accountability in different ways. The Illinois School Report Card that will become public on October 31st will include some new features that we've not seen before on report cards. And probably the most pronounced new feature is that each school will receive a designation from the state. And that designation is based on multiple indicators of student success that are determined in a very complicated calculation of weighting and ranking schools. So, I wanted tonight to just share with you uh, some of those indicators, what the ratings look like, how they're de derived in anticipation of the press you'll see October 31st and afterwards. And then next month we'll have the actual D128 results. So um, the ESSA plan for Illinois has been based on what ISBE calls its uh, mission to really address whole child issues and to include multiple measures of student success. That's very difficult to see. These uh, visuals are taken entirely from um, the ISBE website and supporting documents on the new accountability. But in short, um, we'll go through each of the indicators that you see kind of in that circle. But the, this visual is intended to describe uh, Illinois' mission of measuring not just academic indicators, but also school culture indicators and other measures of student success and preparedness for college and career. So um, what are these multiple indicators? These are also difficult to see on the screen, but I have another visual that it makes, will make it a little bit easier. So 75% of the indicators are based on academic performance 
and 25% are based on additional measures of school quality and student success. Um, another complicating factor this first year of the school report card is that not all of the indicators are available and included in school rankings. So we'll talk a little bit about what each of these indicators is, how the indicator is derived, and which ones are included and not included this year. So um, the high, and in addition, high school indicators are different than elementary school indicators. So it's a very complex ranking and rating system. Um, that I won't explain in complete detail, but when you see our final school designations, you'll understand that it's based on this very complicated formula of first measuring the student data connected with the indicator, and then applying to that an index score, adding up all those scores, and then ranking school districts or schools, not districts, because the ratings are by school, not by district, um, putting all the schools in Illinois in rank order based on their total score from these indicators. So the indicators for high school include um, climate surveys and college and career readiness, the two areas you'll see in gray. Those two areas are hold harmless this year because we don't have the, um, the state hasn't developed the final way to, ways to gather this data and to report it. Um, in the climate survey, we'll all do the five essential survey annually now that was previously only required every other year for districts. So not all the districts in the state, including us, gave the five essential survey last year. We will give it this year and it will in the future be included in our report card. So those two in gray, the college and career readiness also is one of the indicators that they're still defining what that looks like and how schools will collect and share the data. Um, mainly it's based on students reporting of their um, career interests. There are two different designations, one of which is a scholar designation and one is a, a career ready designation, but that's still in development, so you'll get more on that later. For this year, all schools got every point available or 100% on those two hold harmless indicators. Um, ELA and math proficiency are the traditional academic indicators, and that is based on SAT administration to all juniors and is uh, based on the percent of students who meet the uh, readiness benchmark, which the College Board has set it, or not the College Board, the State of Illinois did its own standard setting and set the indicator of uh, college readiness on the SAT as 540 in um, English Language Arts and 540 in Math as the baseline. So the percent of students who are meeting and or exceeding that score on their SAT in um, evidence-based reading and writing and math um, way into that indicator. New too is chronic absenteeism, which is uh, counted as students who are absent for both excused and unexcused absences more than 90% of the school year. Um, that's been quite a controversial um, inclusion in the rating um, because of including uh, absences that are excused, um, including college visits and other things, illness, um, but that is figured into the rating as well. Uh, who are, no, who are absent more than, so who are present, sorry, I might have said it incorrectly, yeah. Chronic absenteeism is students who are, have absences that amount to more than 90% of the school year. So 10% of the school year in, or more in absences, both excused and unexcused. Um, and then finally, there's a, an indicator to measure uh, English learner progress toward proficiency in the English language. And so all of these indicators in the future there is a fine arts indicator that may be developed, so there'll be up to 10 for high schools. All of those indicators um, have weights and scores attached to them. And so ISBE gathers, I have a slide that kind of talks about the process. 
is because on its website definitions of all the indicators that I'm not going to go over what they mean and how that data is gathered. And from that, this method of calculating um, a score for each school is used to place um, schools in tiers. I'm going to go to, this is ISBE slide, I'm going to go to this one that I just put together that's a little bit easier to see. And so um, each school in Illinois will be rated as, a, as exemplary, commendable, underperforming, or lowest performing. Those are the four tiers. And the, the calculation automatically requires that the lowest performing 5% of schools in the district are rated the lowest performing, and the top performing 10% of schools um, are rated top performing. No matter what the scores are from year to year, you'll always have a normal curve where you have the 10% at the top and the 5% at the bottom. Really and that's that, across the state, right? Yeah, yeah. and that determines um, those two um, levels. And so to be an exemplary school, your score has to put you in the top 10% of schools across the state, and you can have no students, student subgroups that fall in the, um, in, uh, the underperforming category, so that would drop you to underperforming. Um, and underperforming also has a compl complicated figure for determining it. So a subgroup whose average score is lower than the all student group score in that lowest 5% of schools across the state is then considered underperforming and it would bring a school's rating from exemplary or commendable to underperforming. Does that make sense? So you have no group as, I'll call it poor as, yes. below 5% when everybody's included. Yes. So they look at all the all student average in those lowest 5% of schools, and none of your subgroups, as long as you have three subgroups with, um, in, in the indicators with 20 students or more. So first of all, you have to, <laughs> it's very complex. First of all, you have to have 20 students in a subgroup, and you have to have at least th three subgroups that have 20 students in it to have your subgroups counted against you. So examples of those subgroups could be? All the basic demographic groups as well as uh, low income, um, students with uh, IEPs, um, former English language learners is a new one. And again, some of these are not English language learners as well as former English language learners. Not all of those subgroups are um, being included in this year's calculations as well. So, um, again, as I said, the designation is by school, so nothing is reported at the district level. Each school receives its own designation. Um, every indication um, that we have presently um, leads us to believe that both of our schools will be ranked exemplary, um, but that um, designation is not final until ISB releases the final report card data on the 31st and um, makes it public. So we're, we're um, we actually have some. We have some preliminary data that suggests that um, our, both of our schools should be in the exemplary category, but that's not um, made public yet, nor is it finalized until October 31st. So when you see school ratings in the newspapers, our assumption is that you'll see um, both Libertyville High School and Vernon Hills High School ranked as exemplary. And we'll be able to let you know that be before <coughs> it's public uh, and let the staff know. But part of what's in, everything's important that we're just talking about, but one of the things that's very important is this is a classic bell curve. Okay, so there are only going to be 10% of the schools that get exemplary designation. All right, so if you are on 10.1, 
you're not going to be exemplary. All right, it's a classic bell curve, and then the next two designations will take you know, and then 10% at the bottom. So um, it's not the way that we would do that as educators, um, and it's not the way that good teachers would do that in the classroom, but it's a system that's been developed. Um, and I think as a result of that, you're again gonna see some really good schools in the state of Illinois that are gonna end up in the commended category. I think it'd be a tier three, because you could be 10.1 yeah. 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 10 with one underperforming subgroup and you go to tier three. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you can be in the top 10% of schools that have one underperforming subgroup. Right. Well, then you're tier two, right? So, uh, if yeah. you have, no, oh. if you're in the top 10% and you have an underperforming subgroup, you, you, you go to underperforming. You go, to yeah. under, you go right to under right right under 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 So, yeah. here's the juxtaposition of this, is that if you happen to be in an area that has multiple subgroups in larger numbers, if you're a great school, and even if those kids are making progress within, you know, that system, you could well end up at underperforming or actually maybe even lowest performing, um, you know, at some point, um, you know, based on on uh, uh, the development of this process. But it's the process that we have. It's the process that uh, the legislature and the governor has supported. And so, um, you know, we're looking forward to getting our data. And as Rita said, we, you know, we, we believe both of our high schools will be at the exempt, exemplary category. Uh, but you can see with the classic bell curve that, you know, there are going to be some other really great schools that are not in that top 10%. The other um, thing to consider is that these um, designations will likely fluctuate a great deal from year to year as they add in the other factors and as, you know, subgroup performance um, continues to weigh in too. So, um, you know, this, this plan, this accountability plan is necessitated under ESSA and there was a lot of pressure to continue to um, look at subgroups and provide resources for subgroups, okay. but again, it, it, which is all good and which we support very much. Um, but, you know, the, the way in which it's um, being handled, on, you know, necessarily sometimes then puts some negative attention on uh, subgroup performance that certainly you don't want to have happen. So, so what they, so what, what's done here? We get it. So, yeah, so schools that are at the um, lowest performing have designated <coughs> Illinois Empower Services that um, provide supports to the school, um, professional learning to the school, and support <coughs> in developing a school improvement plan and resources for doing that. Um, schools at the underperforming um, level are off also eligible to um, participate in some of the Illinois Empower Services. Um, and exemplary districts can volunteer to su support um, some of the underperforming schools in, in ways that um, kind of been, aren't totally yet developed. Okay, so will there be ever a category for the schools um, that shows how much funding they are not getting that they should be getting, so to speak? I'm sure it would certainly be, that would be great. I mean, that would be great. I just think of the, you know, schools, especially down here, the schools that are funded primarily by the state. Yeah. The, the, the other thing you'll see on the, well, you'll see directly on the face of the report card is the adequacy level of each district. So that's an indication of whether they have adequate funding or not to meet the needs of their students. Funding adequacy. Yeah. They set a threshold for the districts, and then you can see on the report card, so if you're a district A, and the threshold for the state is here, and your funding is below that, it actually shows up on a cut line, like on a bar, so it's very clear. Which is also an equally as confusing yeah. complicated yes. formula for determining that. Yeah. And, and just as an aside, if, if this is eerily familiar to you in terms of what No Child Left Behind used to be, it's, um, it's a different version of that. Um, however, um, when we all worked very hard to um, you know, overturn No Child Left Behind uh, because it eventually turned into, you know, a rating of schools and schools that were making great progress that maybe had many subgroups, 
and we're making group pro uh, great progress, we're still labeled as failing schools, even though they were making, they were bellwethers in, in that area or in an inner city area. Um, and so uh, it was really a very unfair process. And many of us worked with Senator Kirk and Congressman Dole, um, who worked across the aisle to actually overturn NCLB. And the thesis was that they would give, they would empower the 50 states to then make their own decisions um, on this. And it, uh, I think I can say this, it's somewhat unfortunate that most of the states, through my contacts with my professional groups, um, have really gone back to a state version of No Child Left Behind uh, in terms of really focusing on, although we have a number of factors here, but really focusing on um, uh, not necessarily improvement, but you know where a school might be at that point. So, but it is the formula that we have, uh, and we all have to work with that. So, a couple of questions. So, to fail, we have to be in the low, in the five percent or below, right? Uh, or if we could be labeled underperforming, no, if, for any soft right. group to so-called fail, it has to be in that lowest five percent group. Is that true? Our score it, has to be within that five percent of the. Total. So the average score of that subgroup for us for us has to be lower than the all student group in that lowest five percent. So they don't compare it to the same subgroup in that lowest five percent. They compare it to the all student group. Okay. And do we get a designation for all of our subgroups? Are we going to know which of our subgroups are closest to being borderline, for example, or even? Even if we just took our own subgroups and ranked them one to the bottom, we would, know, we would be able to target where we're having the biggest issues regardless of where we are? We do get that data. The rankings of schools is, is not public. Where you fall on the list is not public. But we do have our data on our subgroup performance to okay. understand where uh, we have gaps and where we need to fill them. And Pat, do we get a number or do we just get a, you know, it, exceeds, a, meets, doesn't meet? So uh, we know what the threshold is. I was at a meeting on Friday with Ray Clements, who's the, um, in the accountability department at uh, ISBE. And um, we do get a number which tells us what the threshold score was to divide the top 10% from the rest and the bottom 5% from the rest. So we can you know, make some determinations in terms of our data and where our subgroups are in comparison to that threshold. <laughs> We can also see the gaps in how our subgroups perform. Um, Rita, when we, when we talk about, I think this is important for the community to understand. So when we talk about performance, it's performance on what for high school students? So right, what so, is the measure? Right, as I, as I said earlier, the um, performance for um, ELA and math at the high school level is the SAT. And it's the mm -hmm. 11th grade participation in the SLT. So it's, it's one access for English learners. It's one Saturday data point. Saturday morning, Saturday morning. Right. It's one yeah. data point, right? right? One data point the as the, the SAT right. as the, the SAT ELT, that we use in this school. One data point for that indicator, which is a, the percentage of the ranking. Right. So it is to a certain degree there are multiple measures and indicators to a greater degree than NCLB was, but to determine that particular indicator of ELA proficiency and math proficiency. It is solely based on that one score. But those indicators, percentage-wise, are power, are, are so kind of power-driven in terms of the percentage that it really has a pretty dramatic impact on where your rating will be, correct? Based on the pie chart that you had up there. Right, so that, that, yes, the academic indicators, which include, you know, those multiple measures, include the SAT, the EL performance, the graduation rate is weighted most heavily. Um, all of those together um, determine the score that a district gets and ultimately how it ranks in comparison with others. So, yes, that, that indicator is a powerful one, but there are more indicators now that figure into the score than previously was the case. The graduation rate is mm -hmm. about half of half it. Yeah, it's about 50%. 50% yeah. So, it seems a little odd to me, actually. So, Pat, to, to go to a question you raised earlier. So, we used, John and Tom used data at the building level. That certainly includes before ACT data. 
uh, because we would have our kids do explore plan and then ECT. So we had long, longitudinal data from eighth grade and predictive <coughs> data. And then we use other data points. Of course, our kids are doing in our own classes and, and those types of things. So we use a mix of that data. So the essence of the, the heart and soul of data-driven school improvement or data-informed school improvement is multiple measures. So we have a good handle on, and we have had a good handle, uh, on where our subgroups are and our kids are performing. And the planning and articulation that John and Tom do with their building level teams is really predicated on, again, that concept around we want all, we want to be able to demonstrate that all kids are more successful. So they're using multiple data sources, including the data that we get from state testing, to make school improvement decisions and calculations um, and planning on um, you know, what we need to do to help kids be more uh, successful. And this is just another piece of, it's another piece, of, it's another data point. Yeah, at least conceptually, I, mean, I am intrigued by this, because we've never, at least at this level, spent any time discussing, I'll call it our strengths and weaknesses across our population subgroups and what specific actions we're taking to improve those. I mean, in fact, it's part of our discussion. Um, so I think this is very timely, actually. Yeah, and in yeah. fact, um, so this, this quickly, I listed a summary here of all these steps, and there are multiple resources that you know we can look at to explore where these rankings come from. But um, more significantly, when we, when we meet next month, um, our data specialist at each school will be here, Andrea Young and Jennifer Loika, and uh, they're going to share with you some of the work that they've been doing and exactly what we've been talking about. How do we um, focus on the gaps that we have? How do we identify those gaps? And what actions do we take to make sure that every student achieves um, on multiple measures, including measures that we hope to begin to tie to our daring mission and the attributes of our mission. Um, so we know that student success is measured by far more than a standardized assessment. So how do we measure those things? How do we track them? And how do we provide remediation as needed to students who aren't succeeding? That's, That's exactly where we're going. Yeah? I, I'm intrigued by this. Yeah. So, so these are, this is really our driving question for the work that we continue to do. Um, how do we measure those daring attributes? How do we track them? Um, and how do we report them and take action on them? Um, and so next uh, month we'll see uh, the data presentation um, where we focus more on um, what we're presently doing and what we hope to do to continue that work. Just to kind of loop this all around again, if you look at kind of, you know, 10,000, the proverbial 10,000 feet, so Tom's going to Washington in a couple of weeks. They could not get that award if our subgroups were not performing, were not meeting student metrics, okay? So we operate always under the concept that uh, it's continual improvement. So no matter how good any groups of our kids are doing, our planning is to ensure that they will be doing better next year than they were the year before. So that's a kind of a continual uh, loop. If our um, analysis is correct, and both of the schools are exemplary. Uh, again, another data point that our student subgroups are performing, um, you know, better than other per student performing uh, similar groups, um, other places. But uh, regardless of any of that, we're going to continue to use data to drive our decision making, so we can answer the question year over year: Are our kids doing? You know, did they do better this year than they did last year? across the learning spectrum. And uh, I think part of that focus is the reason you see our continued growth on standardized tests like you know ACT, SAT, our growth in AP, because um, statistically, um, we have so many kids that are bunched at the top. The only way you can move the needle is if kids across the learning spectrum are doing better. Okay, and so that's part of our backstory. Uh, as we present you 12 and 14 year, you know, kind of data summaries over that period of time, you can only move the needle like we've moved it here if more kids are being more successful across the entire learning spectrum, not just our kids that might be bunched at 32, 33, 34, 35, 36 on the ACT, but it's bringing kids that might be at 16 or 17 on the ACT to 18, 19, or 20. 
So that will continue to be our focus. So it, it, it'll be very good next month, I think. Um, if I may, just one more question. Yeah. So how does the statewide report card system balance with how the district would normally conduct like its um, goals and its mission? That's a really good question. So um, because we are required to report to the state according to its accountability measures, that's always been an area of focus for us. Um, uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we're considering data about uh, students that participate in our programs, how they achieve in those programs, what kinds of interventions they need to succeed. Um, so we're looking kind of at the um, finer grain detail in regards to how our students are performing and just this you know, one-shot assessment deal that really is the basis for most accountability systems. It's much more important to look at the whole student, what they're involved in, the kinds of things that uh, contribute to their success. Their health and wellness is, is an area of focus for us, as you know, and as we heard in your, uh, your reports to us. So while the state has moved to multiple measures, we as a district have been consistently looking at multiple and more finer grain details about student performance than is required by the state accountability system. Is that what you're asking? And by the way, if we haven't emphasized, you guys are welcome to ask questions at any time, so that's awesome. Glad that you did. <laughs> Right. Well, One of the things, and just kind of in conclusion, it is questions that generate the kind of data that we look at. So that's the focus of our leadership teams is, are we asking the right questions about student achievement? And how do those questions drive the data that we gather to answer them? Right? So I'd love to hear your questions from student perspective as we work through this process about your experience in school and what's working and not working. And we can gather the data to help answer those questions. Okay. Great job, Rita. Very good. Thank you taking very, very good. complex, because this is very complex, and really breaking that down to. And occasionally fast moving. <laughs> Things have changed yeah, that's quite right. a bit in the like years. Like it was last but, yeah. week. Well, yeah. the end of last week. You can't overreact to this data, because I mean, I, I can almost imagine a lot of. 10.5% schools who could have one subgroup and be called underperforming, which the headline will read, you know, big deal. Exactly. That's why we wanted to have this report today, because yeah. I'm sure you'll be reading uh, much about these mm -hmm. changes in the weeks but, to come. But all the more reason why it'd be great for us to know the whole picture and all the other data we have, because, again, celebrating a lot of that data is one day in a year on a single exam. And right. That's what they got. They got it. Yeah, you know, if you're going to standardize and do a grading system, you have to anchor it to yeah, something that's something. consistent yeah. so it's across, not a bad, it's not a bad across the state. Point, it's, just it's a data point. Tom, yeah. um, you wanted to say something? Well, I just I, I appreciate that comment, Pat, because I, I lived that life um, when we were under No Child Left Behind from 2001 to 2012. Highland Park High School was consistently in uh, a failing school, and it was um, because of different subgroups and they were different each year that we were chasing but it was um, it was extraordinarily difficult because we would have entry data where our students were performing let's just say for sake of argument at like third grade reading to fifth grade reading when they entered freshman year and we were uh, bringing them up to 10th grade reading level by their junior year so in two years of academic time we were making multiple years of gains but because it wasn't a growth model, it was just an attainment model, we were consistently rated a failing school. And uh, it was very important for our board to understand the data and for our uh, board to help educate our community about what the data meant because we had kids who should have been celebrated for all of the investment and achievement and growth they were doing, yet they were consistently being sort of initially looked at as a problem because they were the reason that we weren't meeting all of our uh, achievement goals as a district and it was really critical for our, our district office to help educate our board and our board to help educate our community so that these students um, were celebrated for the gifts and attributes that they brought to our school rather than just looked at as a deficit for us. That's a good point. It is exactly what I was referencing yeah. earlier in the, the dangers of focusing too much attention on underperforming groups and the negative uh, reactions to that. Yeah. Well, that's a great topic for us to learn a lot more. Yeah. You did an excellent job of putting yeah. in context.
context for us. Thank you. Darn there. It's going to keep pushing us along, and that's exactly what it was designed to do, right, Rita? Correct. Okay. Uh, next on that, anything else you want to add, Rita? No. Okay. Um, Okay, next on the superintendent's report tonight is amended 2018-19 school calendar, as the board is aware. Uh, we had our version of a hanging shad for a professional uh, development day and Insti Teachers Institute Day. Uh, and based on a number of factors, we were waiting to see what the state testing dates were, how the, um, how the uh, days balance between the semester as a result of that. Uh, so, uh, in um, uh, working with a number of people, and, including the uh, calendar committee, uh, we are recommending the placement of our institute day uh, on Wednesday, uh, November 28th, 3rd, 1st, 21st, can't read the calendar, I should put my glasses on, uh, and that is the day before Thanksgiving. So students, the good news for you to share is that you will not have school the day before Thanksgiving. Okay, is that okay? Did we do all right with that? Yeah. Uh, teachers will be here for a, a planned institute day that will uh, wrap around our overall theme of daring. And uh, we already have a, a plan out uh, with our professional staff here. Um, and uh, that will work fine. Uh, we'll do it, at, uh, as you know, the calendar can be amended anytime during the year. We have snow days and emergency days and floods at Libertyville High School and power outages. and. Uh, we always have to come back and amend the calendar, so we knew that was doable. So our recommendation path to the board is that uh, we place our institute day on Wednesday, November 21st, uh, and then uh, we will amend the ca calendar as reflected. Okay, is there a motion to um, amend the calendar as um, reflected? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I, I have one or two questions on this one, just. Yeah. Real quick, so what is our attendance history on the 20th day before Thanksgiving? Is it? It's, um, it's not terrible. Um, uh, I, it's, I, it's I not can't perfect. say I don't, no, yeah, no, no, I, no. I don't have perfect. the data in front of me to, to cite it specifically. Um, but, you know, families that, that do need to travel to um, celebrate the holiday sometimes take their students out on the day before Thanksgiving. Well, I'm actually thinking more about the people that attend the workshop or the Teachers. Oh, that's oh, 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 no problem. Yeah, no. Yeah, no yeah, I'm thinking more of the institute. Yeah, we have no, no issues with that adult staff. And that'll wrap up by what? I mean, we'll wrap up at 3:30. Oh, right. right. So it does allow us to do a condensed five-day workshop and have yeah. the institute day, yeah. so it provides a little flexibility for our educators as well to um, not, you know, have to be at school until 3:25 on that yeah, day. So students have a day so off. Educators have a little flexibility okay. in their day as well. <laughs> kind of a win-win for everybody. Okay. And a good time of year to do professional learning as opposed <coughs> to putting it off till second semester. Okay, great. Any other discussion? All right, roll call, please. Russell? Aye. Huber? Aye. Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Batson? Aye. Grudy? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, next on the superintendent's report, uh, we can wrap number five and six together uh, because they kind of go together. Uh, LHS pool project update and additional 69 space LHS parking plan update. Uh, Mark. Uh, progress is uh, moving along uh, very well at the site. We finalized uh, the installation of the water main uh, for the site around the building. Uh, we have multiple contractors on site, uh, multiple trades. Uh, plumbers are inside uh, installing piping in the floor, electricians are roughing piping in the walls and in the floors. So we're preparing to pair, pour the slabs around the pool for the pool deck. Um, masons are moving along at a, at a nice pace, um, getting the walls up. Uh, the north wall uh, is completed. Um, we'll have the west wall completed. And um, the south wall will have a hole, leave a hole in the wall to get equipment in and out of, uh, of the site. Um, they've already started installing ductwork because uh, our HVAC equipment is ready. So we're putting the large ductwork in um, above it so that we can slide the equipment in uh, through the uh, east end of the building and then the east end of the building will be bricked up. Um, so some very good progress moving forward. So you're confident we'll get it closed up before winter? Yes, we're, that's our game. We'll, we'll have it uh, all closed up. Well, we're going to have some temporary you know, doors and stuff like that. But I 
Uh, we designed the building with large louvers on the east end of the building. So in the future, when equipment has to be replaced, you can pull the whole louver out and you'll be able to get the equipment in and out of the building. So we thought ahead on that. Um, for the parking, uh, additional parking, progress on that, uh, it's at review with the village engineer. Um, uh, expected to have uh, uh, final uh, comments from them sometime this week. Uh, contractors are, are set, ready to move forward with uh, uh, starting the work. So we will be starting work on site. Um, there's some key things to move around on the site with the bricklayers and equipment and scaffolding before we can start doing curb work uh, around the building. Um, and we're also working to schedule to get the gas uh, brought to the building. When do the escort plants go? Uh, usually after Thanksgiving. They watch the weather, so. Three or four weeks no, left. Yeah, we've got quite a few weeks left. Mark, do we have yet any um, sense of when that lot would potentially be available for use? Uh, the lot will be available in spring once the plants open up again, the asphalt plants. What we'll be doing is putting the initial binder coat down. So when the plants open up in the spring, um, we'll schedule work to come in and um, put the final uh, mm -hmm. finish coat of, of asphalt down and paint straight the parking lots. So same, just to go back to our timeline that we always talk about. So we're still anticipating, I'm asking a rhetorical question, I think. We're still anticipating that sometime in the spring, uh, we will have it full completed and ready for the board to jump in it, okay? And then uh, it kind of running parallel, the parking will be kind of on a similar track. Yeah, right. similar track, it'll all be dependent on weather for the, the asphalt. Generally speaking, if I'm asked that question, I'd say before graduation. Yeah, it will be done before graduation. <clears throat> okay, sounds good. So your class. All right. All right, well done. Okay, uh, next on superintendent's report is freedom of information request. Uh, we had one request uh, since our last meeting. The request was received on 8-29-18 from uh, Charlene Maddox, marketing coordinator uh, for WFF Facility Services in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, the information re requested was regarding Community High School District 128's custodial ground and maintenance services agreement. Um, Ms. Maddox was requesting a copy of the current contract with your facilities provider what was paid to your facilities provider for each of the past two years and the proposal submitted by your facility services provider during the last bidding cycle. Uh, Dan was responsible for follow-up. The response date was 92818, uh, which is also the commercial uh, response uh, deadline and uh, Dan spent about one hour in responding to the request. So um, that is the only FOIA request this month. And uh, just two quick things under other from me tonight. Uh, just a reminder to the board and uh, the administrators here tonight, and most importantly, the community, that the District 128 Foundation will host their big event fundraiser on Friday, November 9th. It will be a White Deer Run um, uh, golf course. Uh, very nice facility. And again, that money is used to fund uh, innovation grants in the school district and also uh, our needy student fund. Um, at this point, the foundation uh, has uh, given roughly $300,000 in innovation grants and they've really been the tip of the spear on our um, innovation work in the district, uh, really leading to our new daring mission. So uh, it's a great opportunity to come out and have a really nice evening uh, with some really friendly people. So um, uh, those of us that have gone every year, um, you know, it's a very nice event and we have a lot of citizens working uh, as part of the foundation on behalf of that event. Scott, I don't know if we're Karen, if you want to make a you can register comment. register on the district website. Right. right. Yep. Yep. It's a great event. And this year should be a little special because there's a pre-event party at the Rudy House beforehand. So <laughs> where we can all go and walk there um, before the event starts. Or maybe that's post-party. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. We need to tell Mrs. Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, not a bad idea. 
Okay, so you can show her the video and just say, oh, yep. I forgot to tell you. Okay, and uh, last, uh, last up, just again, tracking, you know, kind of our projected enrollment at the two buildings. At this time of the year, we're required to do what's called the fall, fall housing report for Illinois State Board of Education, which would include all the students that are housed in our buildings, plus any of our students that are, uh, let's say, outsourced at, for CEDAW services, but are still our students, and we have to account for them because they could come back uh, at any time. So at uh, Libertyville High School, the fall housing report all in is 1,959 students, wow. and at Vernon Hills High School, 1,488. So, um, you know, we are up a little bit at LHS, and we're continuing to rise at uh, Vernon Hills. So we'll be tracking, uh, obviously, those numbers and numbers at District 73 in particular, um, you know, attempting to continue to monitor uh, growth in the south end of the district and potential impacts of that may have on the district, okay? So uh, that concludes, believe it or not, the superintendent's report tonight. Okay, thank you very much. We want to do our informal invite of the uh, students if they would need to leave. Students, if you would like to exit stage left or right, depending on which way you're facing, you can certainly go. Thanks, I am glad you guys were able to stay for that uh, presentation. Yeah, it was great. It was very Thank, you. Thank you. All. Thank you all. You can all week. check uh, Zach out on Wednesday night at 6.30. Barrington. 5. 5 o'clock. 5 at Barrington. Barrington. It'll be warmer than it was at last game. Keep it going, Zach. Okay, keep it going. I guess. One at a time. Okay, next uh, consent vote agenda is listed. Um, can I ask for approval of the okay. consent vote? I have a question on it. I got one too. Let's do the motion, and then we'll come to questions. Right. Is there a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed? So moved. Second. Okay, now any okay. discussion? So you get the same one. I got. No, nah, I got it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Probably no. Uh, the only thing on. Can you just briefly explain? Typically, we've had. Uh, we always like to watch capital outlay. And when I was looking at the expenditure report, it looked like capital outlay was going pretty fast this year, i.e. at 60% in some areas, I think in one of the funds. Uh, is, is, there, is there something in there that would drive it up that high? Whereas, again, it should be about 25% because we're a quarter of the way through the year. And again, that just kind of, when I was scanning stuff, that just kind of popped in me and I'm like, ooh, capital outlay, obviously a bigger line item, and we're at 60%. So, uh, just kind of address maybe what might be in there, if we front-loaded some stuff, uh, or what's going on there maybe? Yeah, short answer is a lot of that, the capital outlay, particularly in front 20, might be where you're looking. Um, the, a lot of that work is done during the summer, and so the big bulk of that work is done in the summer, and then we pay it August, you know, we pay some in July, some in August, September, you know, we get some still carrying over in October. So. A bulk of the capital projects that we'll typically spend the money on is right around the summer months. So it's almost an inverse relationship of salaries, which we get, you know, it looks low, but it's really not low because we pay September through June. Yeah, correct. So, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, correct. So when I'm analyzing um, trending and seeing, looking what I'm doing, you know, I'll look at salaries and benefits relative to our fiscal year because those need to track exactly per the payrolls. So if you read the written report, you're tracking great. I love the way we've been able to kind of split out things so I can, so I can actually track properly now. Um, now the other things, services and supplies and everything, those are those will be buried. So I look, I look more finely detailed because some things, purchase services wise, we buy once a year. And so that makes sense for some of those line items to be 100% spent because, you know, we buy insurance like once a year, right? right? And so those kind of things I take into context when I'm, when I'm looking at how we're trending. Um, as, as an example. So, so we're okay on capital outlay. You don't yes. see, okay, thank you. So it's a gauging issue. The timing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Mine is actually simple. I'm, I think the answer is yes, but I noticed trips two and three were 2020. Yes. Okay. So I just want to make sure that's right. Planning ahead. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? All right, roll call, please. Uh, Huber. Aye. Luce. Aye. Lundstead? Aye. Batson? Aye. Grudy? Aye. Pesto? Aye. All right, motion carries. Facilities and Finance, uh, Chairperson Luce. Okay, okay. Um, first thing on the uh, list is 2008 tax levy estimate. 
Scott, kind of before Dan know. starts, let's note for the record in the community we are not <coughs> voting on the tax levy tonight. Yes, there's no vote tonight. This there is, is no this vote is tonight. Discussion for <coughs> there appears to be some sense that the <coughs> was voting here on the tax levy tonight in the <coughs> some a few people in the community, and that is not an accurate statement. That is true. All right, so tax levy estimate, Dan. Yep, so I wanted to put together um, some information uh, similar but more condensed to what you saw a few weeks ago. Uh, so we have, is there, is there a clicker you said? Oh, sorry. Right here. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. um, so I just want to go over a few things as a reminder for both the board and those in attendance and um, watching later online to do so. Um, one of the things that's required by state law is that before a board can adopt a levy according to something called the Truth and Taxation Act, uh, no less than 20 days before you do that, the board has to estimate what their levy will be because if you estimate that you're going to ask, because again, remember the levy is the amount of dollars you're asking for, if you're gonna ask for more than 105% of what you got last year, so more than a 5% increase, then you have to do you have to you have to do what's called a, a truth and taxation hearing. You have to publish a notice in the paper. A lot of uh, hoops to jump through legally. You have to do, and so this is an exercise basically for us to do that together and to show what is our estimate of the money. Same, really same information that I shared last time, but I'm just kind of doing a formal and a board meeting for you. That's totally including new property, right? Uh, it, uh, yeah, well, yes. What you're asking for versus what you got last year, all in. Mostly all in, so our truth and taxation is a little, can be tricky, but it's essentially all in. <coughs> all right, so really well, I wanted to provide you some information on history. I've got a slide also that I was able to update on one of the charts last time that I didn't have, but I have it now. Um, information for the 2018 levy estimate and then next steps. Uh, so in terms of our history, uh, this is our total uh, extension all in that you can see in history in the last 70 years. Um, and just, just giving you that data point, I. 2017 added in there, really showing that it, it this is going to be all in, so this is also going to include debt service, but you can kind of see it, it has gone up and down depending on, you know, some of that, those abatements and everything that happened. Um, so as you can see, kind of a history of our extension. Now here is a slide that I was able to update with 2017 numbers. So what this, what this shows is the last uh, eight years, eight, eight years, um, starting in 2010 as a baseline, and kind of showing the, the light blue is what you what the actual levy and extension was. Um, right, you asked for a certain amount of money, but then the extension is what you got. So really, it's the extension, but that's a kind of a weird word, so we'll call it levy. Um, the actual levy we had um, in 2010, and then from then on, you can see what the actual numbers were throughout 2017. Then what I have showing is what those numbers would have been had the district decided to not do any abatements. So you can see in the years, basically um, 2011 through 2015, um, the actual levy was less than what you could have levied um, had you decided not to do abatements. So those, that's showing the, basically the difference in the impact of the abatements on the levy uh, for, the, for those, that time period. Then in um, the uh, gold kind of color is that there was a decision, I, don't, I honestly can't remember which uh, year it was um, to adjust, it might have been between the 15 and 16 year, uh, to adjust uh, the actual levy ask. And so what that, what that gold bar is, what is if you had maxed out your levy every single year, where it would be at. So this is just kind of trying to show you data that you have not asked for as much as you could have um, over the years, really. It just showing that data. So going forward, because there is no debt service, uh, anymore, we don't have any debt issuance. You know, uh, those the differences in the actual levy versus levy of no abatements is going to be the same because there's nothing to abate anymore. Um, so we'll just kind of keep watching this as the years go um, to show you that information. So in terms of the EAV, sorry, the funds is a little tiny, but this is me breaking out what I've gotten the estimate data from the county assessor um, in terms of how our how what the what the property values, how those split apart in our district. The vast And just for the audience, can you explain EAV, what that means? Yeah, EAV is the equalized assessed value. So it's essentially, if you've ever heard the term, the tax base, uh, it's really, it's a correlation between the property values uh, in, the, in, the, in the taxable properties within our district. So there's things you can't tax, like other governmental properties, um, some hospitals, 
So this is tax things you can tax. And so the, the value is done by the assessor. Then they assess that value. There's the value is the fair market value. So if you have a house worth 500,000, that's the value. Then they assess it, which is a third of the value. And then they equalize it, which is a factor given by the state. Um, our factor is one, so it's kind of simple. So we equalize the assessed value. That's essentially trying to look at the property values in our district. Um, and you can see the vast majority is residential, but then we do have a pretty healthy balance of industrial and uh, commercial. Can you read that? Can you just read what's in that? I can't see it. What are, what are the pie? What are the pieces? Yeah, so the, the different classifications for pie property tax, residential, I can't see that number, but I'm guessing it's somewhere up close to 70. 7% for residential. Thank you. Industrial is the green, which is 10%. Industrial 10%. Commercial is the yellow, 19.8%. Commercial 19.8. Sliver of red is farm at 0.5%. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Sliver of farm at 0.5, just to get it on the audio in case they can't hear. So that, that's the, 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 the rough categories that EAV is classified for us, how we that data we get. Um, and so that, that's that's your tax base. That's what makes up your tax base in this in this district. Yeah. Yep. What percent does that include? Uh, seven. Okay. Yep. Hey Dan, could you go back one slide for a second? Can we just add something to this slide? Actually, it would be interesting on this slide to just make a statement that says we have basically, I don't know what the red line would be, under levy X amount relative to what we could have. Because everybody's always beating people like us up for maximizing what they what they left for and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot that we left on the table. Correct. That is, uh, whether or not it's a lot, of, oh, I, I couldn't tell you. you. They have left money on the table, and because of the compounding impact of that, this will perpetuate. In yeah, the that's future. right. Yeah, but I think it, it would be a good statement to put on a slide like this because we might use this slide publicly in some of our future things. So, I mean, basically, I, again, I don't know what the exact language is, but we basically have under levy X amount relative, and it's probably even more than that. Yeah, I, I, can, I have uh, some data. You, you've not maxed out your levy by, by a certain amount. You didn't amount. max out in 17. And we didn't do no, it no, you, you have. You, d you did in 17, but the goal is if you had never done any other previous. So it's part of the compounding you just oh, talked about. Compounding. Right. That's because we, we right. but, but, but to this point, it's still relevant. It, it is. It's, it's still relevant. And I think there is still, as we go through and we vote on this next month, correct? I think it's also very good to have an educational component to this because as you go through, once again, you will have a certain proportion of residents mm -hmm. whose taxes will go up. And the hypothesis or their belief is, wow, they're taking much more money than they were previously because my taxes went up 8% hypothetically, right? The reality of this is that whole equalized assessment you have a certain percentage that we can only take. If somebody's tax is going up, it's not because we're taxing significantly more than we could or should, but also it gets into this equalized where we've talked about somebody's taxes could go up. If that is set as a certain threshold overall across all residents, somebody's going down. Correct. And people don't understand, they just think, wow, look at my tax bill. The majority of this is going to X, Y, Z, municipalities, schools, 70, 73, 128. My hypothesis is, wow, they're taxing me more. And I just think part of when we go through that to understand what are we able to get, mm -hmm. what do we really get, and then how does that affect somebody's tax bill? Correct, and I have some of that information on a, on the, on a later slide. Okay. Let's just kind of flush that out a little bit. Uh, because it can certainly sound confusing when we say it's going to go up by this much and people have different numbers. Yes. Because uh, it's, it's, it's going up. It, we're, when we're talking going up, it's, it's a, a generalization, but it's always going to be relative to each person's own property and how that property changed for sure. And in, and in general, there's a couple of points that Dan and I always talk about that we've done and board here a number of times. So remember in Illinois, the property tax um, in the Collar counties in Chicago. Uh, surrounding Chicago, are, uh, we're in a property tax cap. Okay, so we are capped at 5% or CPI, whichever is higher. Less, whichever is less. Which is ever less. So, I thank you, Chad, for that correction, which is ever less. So, um, last year, CPI is that, is that designated by 
the fat of the stimulus ones. So the aggregate levy that we can take in across all taxpayers is capped at 2.1%. So regardless if Scott's taxes go up $5,000 and might go down a 1,000, the aggregate levy that we can get from all of the pie chart that Dan showed before is a residential, commercial, industrial property is capped at 2.1%. Now the other factor, there's two factors, it's kind of like an A and a B. The other factor is new growth, and we have one opportunity to capture new growth. So if we bring that new growth in, Dan puts that in a percentage, or the county, or the township puts that in a percentage. And so if somebody sees, for example, a 2.9% levy, our aggregate levy that we take from actual taxpayers is still capped at 2.1%. The extra growth is on top of that and specifically for the new growth. So Scott doesn't have to pay you know, more taxes for us to get that new growth and it broadens the tax base. So we need to keep, you're right, we need to just continually repeat those messages because somebody gets their tax bill and they go, well, my tax bill went up four and a half percent. You know what, the superintendent and the board lied to me. You know, they told me we were capped at 2.1%. Our aggregate levy is capped at 2.1%, plus the new growth on top of that, which does not impact current taxpayers. That's not taken from or in addition to current taxpayers. Or to say it differently, the, the, the bottom line is the difference in anyone's tax bill other than the 2.1% is just your valuation change. Yeah. Other so if your taxes change different from 2.1% up or down, then it's all due to the fact that your valuation went up or went Kind of. I'll, I'll, I'll show what, the, what the, the tipping point is. Um, so to continue on, um, so new property. Um, so we have new property that is able to come on the rules. Um, our taxable new property is 14.3 million, which is right in line with our average. Um, now, just FYI, Melody Farms, you'll see that's actually in a TIF area. So all the growth from there, which is substantial, is not taxable for us. Um, that goes into the TIF fund for the next 23 years. Um, so we wish them well, but we wish them really well 23 years from now. Um, be the only one that will still be here. I'll let you know what happens. So, Probably. yeah. Um, so just a few things that I try to look at in the, when I'm seeing new property, non-residential improvements, because the vast majority of our new property is people making small, big improvements to their houses. Um, but in terms of the non-residential stuff, Menards uh, came online at a valuation of 2.5 million. Now that's the EAV, so that's not the actual fair market value, but that's the EAV that's assigned. Uh, Care Animal Hospital, uh, at Libertyville on Park, just west of Butterfield. Look, I'm getting the lingo of the streets here. I'm getting there. Um, I was terrified about saying that. I didn't know if I was gonna say it right. Uh, I, Bryant had to help me rehearse how to say that. Um, and then Chase Bank, which is right by Menards, at a valuation of about 400000 So those are just a few high points. I'll try to look at those every year just to let you know what's coming out. Like last year was the, uh, one of the hospital uh, advocate had a, an addition that they did, and another one was um, Uncle Julio's came on. So I'll let you guys know those. Here's something interesting um, in terms of the new property that's added. Um, what new property was added dollar-wise uh, this year versus last year? So the blue is last year. So Last year you can see, and it's by class, again I apologize for the small text, but it looks big enough on my screen. Um, I guess I wasn't standing yeah, we far enough away from the screen. Future paper copies or a WebEx or something. So yeah, this is the, the same information class. that we had uh, two mm -hmm. weeks ago, uh, too, but maybe we were closer to the screen then. Um, so residential improvement, it's interesting to see how it just kind of ends up working out the same. Uh, residential improvement is more, so there's more uh, new construction happening in residential improvement relative to a year ago. Both a farm and commercial is relatively the same. Industrial is my one outlier that looks a little tad weird, so uh, that's one thing that I'm kind of looking into more. There's seems like there's really no industrial uh, new property done, and so I'm trying to figure out if that's true or if I've got an error in the data somewhere. Yeah, so Abbott would be the biggest for sure that we have, and so the question is, is Abbott building anything? I, you know, I, don't, I don't drive it by there. Well, I, I drive by there every day, but I don't, you know, pay attention to what's going on. So that's something I want to research into. Um, so now in terms of our, 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 our levy estimate for 2018. So uh, what I'm estimating our extension is, is at 78.4 million. Um, that's an increase of the CPI, which 
or to keep it simple, we'll call it the rate of inflation. The CPI stands for Consumer Price Index, but let's call it the rate of inflation to keep it simple. Uh, and the rate that we use for that year is 2.1%. Uh, new property that's added on uh, that I've calculated to be an impact of about 0.42%. That's the 14 million uh, applied uh, to our EAV um, to, for a total increase of 2.52%. Now, uh, the point I want to make is actual increases to existing properties will average uh, 2.1 relative to the change in assessment. So the average will be 2.1, but the actual change per parcel will be relative to how that parcel changed. And I do have a slide that will kind of show a little bit more information. It's not that <coughs> uh, Francis, do you mind switching to that worksheet? So this is the worksheet that I really updated for you. And when we met two weeks ago, I told you that I had kind of the, the, um, the overall number that I do. Now I have the actual specific numbers, and I've even included the packet. The resolution is ready to go um, for, for the actual numbers to use when I'm looking at fund balances and what each fund needs uh, in, order, in terms of how they're operating. Uh, so I know one thing that I've heard you mention a little bit over the years is looking at the, the balance between that fund. I think we're making some changes to put more money there that will that will kind of help balance things out in the future. So we're making, I've kind of looked at all those numbers and, made, and we're able to look at that. Uh, the big thing to focus on really is that number in the bottom right hand corner and that is the 2.91%. That's the number that if that number is, five, is more than 5%, so if it's 5%, that's okay. 5.00, that's okay. 5.01, it's over 5% then the truth in taxation kicks in. So because it's under that, it doesn't. Now technically, you could levy 4.8%, 4.9%, and still not be under the 5%, right? But we kind of, based on what we've talked about, you know, that that additional cushion really at the end of the day for us is unnecessary. And so the 2.9 different than the 2.5 estimate I have, that 0.4 is really kind of my estimate for errors because, um, some of the data looks a little weird for me right now, particularly like industrial stuff. I want to kind of check into that. But it gives me a little bit of cushion in terms of um, not accidentally leaving money. If you want to intentionally do that, that's fine. But you don't want to do it on accident. So we wouldn't miss anything that's there, but we may not get that 2.91. You won't get the 2.91. Uh, the 2.91 again, just to beat that kind of force over and over again, is 2.1. Right, plus new growth. Well, the, the two, the, the, so the two point nine one is the two point one for existing property, point four two for new growth, and then a little bit more for cushion because those number, those other number, the other estimates, particularly new property and EAV values, are based on estimates. So in the formula for how all that how that algebra works, two of my four variables are unknown. I have to right. guess those variables, so that allows me some variance. In totally variables. understand that. The point to make again for John, Mr. and Mrs. Citizen at home that is trying to figure this very complex thing out that you do a great job of bringing down to people to understand that anything above 2.1, whether it's 2.52 or it's 2.91, is new growth, would be considered new growth, correct? And it will not add to the individual taxpayer's burden. Correct? Beyond the CPI. Beyond the CPI. Beyond the 2.1. In aggregate, aggregate. yes. Aggregate, right. Yes. So, uh, oh, do you mind flipping back? Hey, Dan, why would yes. I ever put 4.8 out? Or 4.5 out? Because I'm never going to get it. I don't think. Um, you. How would I get that? How would you get 4 point? Uh, if you had a significant amount of new property that's happening. So I'll give you an example. Historically, historically, that's what's been done. We throw out a huge number just in case, and, and that's why we, years ago, argued, why would we do that? you got to publish it. It's all the bad will. So I'd have to project. Yeah, right, that's exactly what I was thinking. If Melody, if Melody Farms um, was coming under our rules, that would generate a lot of money, and I'd have to look at that. Um, I'll give you a more real example. In my previous district, we had a TIF actually come off. So. I somehow got there in year 22, and then it came off, and we saw the TIF come out. We saw substantial, we knew this was coming, and of course this came at a very difficult political time, right? And so we knew that we were gonna have an increased growth of property tax revenue of $600,000 from this TIF. So we had to ask for, um, I, I thought we were gonna end up getting probably like five-ish, but I wasn't sure. We ended up asking for like, I think somewhere between six and eight. 
but you had to go. You had to do the, the truth and taxation at that point because you you do, you want to you want to be sure. And I think we we ended up getting like really closer, a tad under five. Um, but that was an example of you know something that you want to make sure if you have a big new construction coming on, that's when you'll be. But but if you have a situation like in our community that you kind of know what's going on, but you know there's nothing big. Um, the reason you would ask for a 4.8 is because it's not five. And you have a lot of cushion in case you have some very weird numbers. So we try to mitigate mitigate some of that. Um, and that was kind of a lot of the discussion that we worked in last year. We we're trying to figure out kind of an overall, um, I guess, philosophy around that, I guess, if you will. So, but at some, point when, at some point, when that big new block of property comes on, let's just say Adams building another big, huge building, we're getting a lot more revenue. You know, we complain all the time the reason our taxes are so high is there's not enough of industrial base, you know, and all the residential housing is paying for it. But then when the industrial base comes, we take all the money. So at some point, people have a legitimate beef that says, well, where's my relief? Okay. Can I, I'm not sure if it's the right time for the question, but does the commercial end operate in the same way as the residential in that if the value of, I'm thinking of the mall, which is sitting largely empty now, if, if that valuation a year from now, So the, the, the few things that in theory, so in theory if it's valuation drops, then the taxes they would pay would get spread to other people. And over, totally simplify the theory. Yeah. 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 Any, yeah. any of them. Yeah. 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 Theirs goes down, yours goes up. And, and the whole, that's the whole point of the valuation process is to the quote unquote fair share. How do they figure it out and spread that fair share? Um, but the reality is, is what that will do is impact the aggregate. And so that will that will impact the aggregate so that depending on how your property values change relative to the average change of the entire EAV spectrum, that's what it'll, it'll impact. So if that goes down, it will lower, you know, so if you're, in a, in a, if you're in a period where your property values are growing faster than the average, this, if you have something big drop in value, that will lower the average and thus potentially give you a circumstance where you can end up be paying more than the average. So the fact that this new commercial space, the retail space is coming in that's in a TIF district might empty out even more of the other existing and might bring the values of those. Well, it's, so it's now, possible. I, mean, I was with uh, Senator Vernon Hills Leaders meeting two weeks ago and the uh, village administrator and director of development were there. And they're pretty bullish on the reconfiguration yeah. of the mall over the next two years. Uh, and I think what Karen is really referencing are the big anchor stores, the traditional well, anchor stores. Well, the owner of the mall go after well, the well, Sears, Penny's. But the, the, the owner of the mall is very bullish on the mall, is working with the village, uh, I think, to recreate malls in the way they're recreating malls, you know, to be different than being anchored by the four. But um, I, I think they're pretty encouraged by their work, appeal. meaning the Vernon Hills, uh, meaning the Vernon Hills administration. Um, they, and it's gonna take a couple of years to do probably everything that they're going to do uh, over there. But Dan, it leads to another question. Is retail the same kind of tax base as commercial industrial? So for example, does uh, Abbott pay a higher rate of tax than the mall does? Um, per EAV, no. Per dollar of EAV, no, but how the EAVs are calculated are exactly. slightly different. Um, they, they'll they take into account not just the value of the building that it's in, but also the revenue that that building can generate. They take that into account when they're for, valuing. For Abbott or for the for mall? Commercial, industrial. So it, the mall would be commercial, uh, retail would be considered commercial. So they take sure. those things into consideration when they're valuing those properties. Well, but like, look at the NARS, two point five million dollars, and that building probably cost five times that. Well, that's the. Well, that's the. Well, yeah. So the uh, the actual valuation of what was because the land that was already there had value, had substantial value, um, already. So it's really the building on top. I think it'll be interesting to see how that goes in the future because again, this is always as of January first. So I don't know what the status of the well, NARS was on January first of twenty eighteen. Those things are valued at the you know as pole mark. All of the inside fixtures and everything they do to build that are often not not counted. 
the, the, the personal, sorry, excuse me, the personal property isn't, but 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 the the, va the actual valuation of that property is according to um, the state law is is based on the the, inc the capitalized income flow of that property. Okay. So, all right. So suffice it to say. So, what's the next step here? Um, next step is to switch back to the slide. So. Um, so the next steps would be review uh, this again at our November 5th uh, Facilities and Finance Committee uh, meeting and then look for adoption at our November 12th board meeting. Okay, can you go back one slide again? Yeah. Because when we're doing good presentations, you always make your key points at the beginning and in the middle and at the end. So let's one more time come back to, we are capped at the aggregate, so all the taxes we collect from all of the means at 2.1%, correct? Yep. Okay. And then any new property, okay, which is not an additional expense to any of the individual taxpayers, it's simply us capturing that new growth. So if the levy is 2.52% or 2.92%, 2.1 is the aggregate can only go up 2.1 and the new growth moving into it. So Scott is not gonna have to pay an additional, you know, above 2.1. He's not going to have to pay the 2.9. Well, Scott might. I've got an in. I've got an in yeah, with the treasurer. Uh, so <laughs> we, that's it too. Um, you would only the other the other board. If, if I pay, if I pay to hire, someone's paying less. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't mean individually. So and one thing I, I had a different slide here, but I must have removed it. So essentially, what this will depend on, and this is all estimates right now, but. The idea is that our EAV across the board, if our existing properties, not new property getting added, existing property is going up 3.43%. And so, on average, property owners, if their value goes up by 3.43%, their taxes for our, por for our portion will go up CPI. If your value goes up more than the 3.4%, you will likely probably see an increase that's more than that. So yeah. that's how, so it pivots on, goes up the, it pivots on the average, yeah. uh, what the average is charged. Yeah, one other, when you present it again like, next time, because I think the question people always ask, well, again, you know, why shouldn't that new property go for relief to residential taxpayers? We can do a quick calculation. I, I think it turns out to be tens of dollars to people, um, but it might be worth, you know, having that number. You know what I mean? Yeah, so it works out to be about 350000 on a levy of $78 million. Yeah, and I think it's a $300,000 house, it would be about 15 bucks if I did my quick calculation correctly. But, I mean, I think if that's true, it's worth saying because it's not making a difference. At which point, it really is to the advantage of the school. It's smart for the school to pay the money. Okay. Well, I mean, with new growth, we only have one opportunity to do that. Right. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think again, it's a realistic thing for people to push back and say, "Yeah, we should take the money we need." I don't think that's true. Okay. Right. But to educate them and say, "Well, let me tell you what I'm taking. I'm taking 15 bucks." All right. So next item on the list is a voting item. Oh. Uh, yeah, just a quick <coughs> review, and then uh, Dan and Mark can jump in. As the board is aware, uh, we had uh, some elect significant electrical issues at Libertyville High School. We had to do some uh, emergency repairs that uh, you know I communicated with uh, you as individual board members um, about. Um, we need to come back on the back side of that since it, uh, I gave um, Dan and Mark emergency authorization uh, to do those needed repairs. Um, we need to come back on the back side uh, of getting that process rolling uh, and simply do uh, a resolution. You have a copy of the resolution uh, that we worked on with, uh, you know, Len Himes. Um, and you will see the thresholds that there is uh, $30,000, and that's just in case we're estimating the repairs around 22 or 23 right now. So it actually came in a little less because they were actually able to find a part um, for uh, the situation that they needed. Uh, but just in case we get in there and uh, there's some other issues, uh, the $30,000 threshold gives us enough cushion without having to come back with you again, stop the work, come back to you again, um, call special meeting and get authorization. So, Dan? Yeah, so really, you know, we, with the emergency in place, you know, the initial estimates we got were quite a bit higher in terms of what those do and it could push you past the threshold that's required for bidding. So you'd have to go out and bid, 
but we don't have time because we really need to have power for the building, so we don't have time to do all those other steps. Um, so we kind of moved that process along really fast, and um, the revised proposal we had was right around the 22,000 mark. But that is just for the actual contractor doing their, their parts and labor and installation. There's also going to be some work that we're anticipating from ComEd, but we don't anticipate it to be super significant. That's why we have the round number of 30,000 in there. And if it ends up that we spend less than 25,000, this may not have been something we ever needed to bid, but we would rather be safe than sorry and more transparent, certainly on the front end of having a resolution saying that we could spend more money than we actually really needed to spend. Uh, so that's that's really kind of the, the so purpose. The 30,000 is intended to cover everything. The 30,000 is intended to cover everything for the fix, we had the we had we had the the initial emergency patch job. Is that a yeah, fair word? That. Yeah. that we already paid for that. That was seven. -ish. So this is the true yeah. fix. This yeah. is yes. the this, this is, is the true fix right. um, that we have that is still classified as emergency because it, it's a, not a short process to get this done and figured out and everything like that. So we had to move that along. So All right. So if I I state this properly, we're looking for a motion to approve the resolution that we had. Basically the resolution is to allow superintendent, assistant superintendent to go ahead and do finance to negotiate a contract um, for this 3,000 amp um, switch and installation to not, that will not exceed, or I should say, will not exceed $30,000. Another way to say it is up to $30,000. And the resolution authorized the superintendent and Dan to take all the actions necessary to purchase this uh, and report back to the board on their status. Do I have a motion to approve this? Scott, one other addition to that, just for knowledge, and I think uh, you're aware of this, but just to repeat this again, um, under statute, now we're doing the emergency resolution, it requires six yes votes to carry the resolution. Very good point. Okay. So moved. Second. So any questions? Dialogue. I, I just want to be sure since I don't think you were there at the last facilities and finance meeting, uh, we were all extremely grateful for the hard work of your team who went above and beyond to respond to this situation. So please pass along our gratitude. Um, it was not overlooked. Thank you. All right. Can we have a roll call? Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Jackson? Aye. Grudy? Aye. Pestle? Aye. Huber? Aye. Okay, motion passes. I think that's six out of six yes votes, so thank you. Okay, anything else? Uh, any, anything other? That would be it. Okay, program personnel, Chairperson Batson. Thank you, Dr. Grudy. Uh, we have uh, two employment actions here that did not make it on the uh, consent agenda. One is a uh, resignation and the other is a uh, a replacement hire. So, have a motion in the second. Uh, so moved. Second. Okay. Um, any discussion, question, comments? Oh, okay. Roll call, please. Lundstedt? Aye. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Hessel? Aye. Huber? Aye. Luke? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Uh, anything other than category other? If not, that concludes the uh, PMP. Okay, thank you. No property. No property. No CEDAW, yeah. no IASB. Oh, okay. Um, so, can I ask for a motion to convene an executive session? Uh, two matters tonight. One, collective negotiating matters, 5 ILCS 120-2C2. And the second is employment of employee, 5 ILCS 120-2C1. Second. <laughs> All right, moved by Karen, second by Lisa. Uh, any discussion? Not roll call, please. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Hessel? Aye. Huber? Aye. Luce? Aye. Munster? Aye. All right, motion carries. And again, other than to take action to return to the session, there is no action following the executive session tonight. So, good night, everybody.